stockviews.com, the community for serious investors. Benjamin Graham, legendary value investor. Benjamin Graham is known as the father of value investing. The heyday of his investment career spanned from the 1920s to the 1950s, during which time he also lectured a popular course on finance at Columbia Business School. Many of his students went on to practice his method of security analysis and achieved outstanding results over a number of decades. This elite group of disciples includes Warren Buffett, Walter Schloss, Irving Kahn, and Charles Brandis, and they stand as a testament to the brilliance of Benjamin Graham. In 1934, he wrote the investment classic Security Analysis, which set out an intellectual framework for value investing. It has been used as a reference text by successful value investors ever since, and much of this lecture is based on material from that book. In this short video, we will cover three of the most important concepts to come out of Benjamin Graham's work. Intrinsic value, margin of safety, and earnings power. We will then go on to study in more detail some of the analytical techniques that are derived from these concepts. Lesson 1. Intrinsic Value Intrinsic value defies precise definition, and Graham himself called it an elusive concept. However, intrinsic value is core to the understanding of a value-investing philosophy. Let's see how Graham described it in his own words. In general terms, it is understood to be that value which is justified by the facts, for example, the assets, earnings, dividends, definite prospects, as distinct, let us say, from market quotations established by artificial manipulation or distorted by psychological excesses. The thing about Graham's approach is that we aren't required to measure intrinsic value precisely. We are only interested in how it compares approximately to the prevailing market price. The essential point is that security analysis does not seek to determine exactly what is the intrinsic value of a given security. It needs only establish either that the value is adequate or else that the value is considerably higher or considerably lower than the market price. For such purposes, an indefinite and approximate measure of the intrinsic value may be sufficient. To use a homely simile, it is quite possible to decide by inspection that a woman is old enough to vote without knowing her age, or that a man is heavier than he should be without knowing his exact weight. Key to success in value investing, then, is ensuring that your estimate of the intrinsic value is much greater than the price you pay for that security. Lesson 2. Margin of Safety This brings us on to margin of safety. Graham recognized that any estimate of intrinsic value would be flawed. Much of the value of a security is based on future results, results which are inherently unknowable. This is why he always insisted on a margin of safety between the estimated intrinsic value and the market price paid. It is available for absorbing the effect of miscalculations or worse than average luck. The buyer of the bargain issues places particular emphasis on the ability of the investment to withstand adverse developments. In practice, this means that opportunities may not arise that frequently, since securities may appear only mildly undervalued or overvalued most of the time. However, the value investor must be patient in waiting for these opportunities to present themselves. Since we have emphasized that analysis will lead to a positive conclusion only in the exceptional case, it follows that many securities must be examined before one is found that has real possibilities for the analyst. By what practical means does he proceed to make his discoveries? Mainly by hard and systematic work. Lesson 3. Earnings Power Graham criticized the market for placing too much importance on current year earnings and the earnings trend of the market. These are criticisms that could apply equally today and they often cause the market to become overly optimistic or pessimistic. Graham suggests that an analyst should be focused more on the historical record of the company. Only a thorough analysis of the past can provide any degree of confidence in the future. This is the thought process that inspired the concept of earnings power. 
It combines a statement of actual earnings shown over a period of years with a reasonable expectation that these will be approximated in the future, unless extraordinary conditions supervene. Rather than focus on the current year's earnings as the market does, Graham advocated taking an average of past earnings as a guide to the future. He suggested looking back between 5 and 10 years. Of course, this was only a starting point, and the analyst would then need to exercise judgment as to whether this gave a reasonable approximation of future earnings power. In order for a company's business to be regarded as relatively stable, it does not suffice that the past record should show stability. The nature of the undertaking, considered apart from any figures, must be such as to indicate an inherent permanence of earnings power. While the market tends to apply a multiple to current year earnings, Graham instead suggested applying a multiple to the earnings power in order to arrive at an appropriate price. This does not mean that all common stocks with the same average earnings should have the same value. The common stock investor, for example the conservative buyer, will properly accord a more liberal valuation to those issues which have current earnings above the average, or which may reasonably be considered to possess better than average prospects or an inherently stable earning power. He suggested that the intelligent investor should be conservative in the multiple of earnings power that is paid. While he recommended varying the multiple based on the prospects of the company, he ventured that a conservative investor should not pay more than 20 times for any stock. Lesson 4. Benjamin Graham and Growth Stocks Graham was wary of investing in growth stocks for two reasons. One, unusually rapid growth does not keep up forever. Two, the price may already discount future growth. It must be remembered that automatic or normal economic forces militate against the indefinite continuance of a given trend competition, regulation, the law of diminishing returns, etc., are powerful foes to unlimited expansion. Graham is telling us that the analysts should be very cautious about extrapolating recent trends, because conditions for the business can, and often will, change. Woo-hoo! Uh-oh. He demonstrates this point with reference to one of the most popular growth stocks of the 1920s, Cody, which still exists to this day as a manufacturer of beauty products. In 1929, Cody was earning more than it had in any of the past 10 years, and the trend looked spectacular. The market was happy to price the stock on the basis of 1929 earnings, and moreover was willing to apply a multiple of 30 times to the earnings because it imagined the recent trend would continue. In the event, earnings plunged over the next three years and the multiplier contracted sharply. By 1932, earnings had fallen nearly 90% and the multiplier applied was only four and a half times at the low point. The stock had dropped from a high of $82 in 1929 to a low of $1.5 in 1932. Graham cautioned that whole industries were also subject to rapid change. Even where demand remained strong, supply would often grow faster. The growth industries of Graham's era included radio, aviation, electric refrigeration, and silk hosiery. All these industries saw a period of high demand, followed by a period of increasing supply leading to depressed returns. Graham recounts how the preferences of the market would shift with time. In 1922, department stores were very favorably regarded because of their excellent showing in the 1920-1921 depression, but they did not maintain this advantage in subsequent years. The public utilities weren't popular in the 1919 boom because of high costs. They became speculative and investment favorites in 1927 to 1929. In 1933 to 1938, fear of inflation, rate regulation, and direct governmental competition again undermined the public's confidence in them. In 1933, on the other hand, the cotton goods industry, long depressed, forged ahead faster than most others. Equally, Graham cautioned we should be wary about automatically assuming that a downward trend will continue forever. Where the trend has been definitely downward, the analysts will assign great weight to this unfavorable factor. He will not assume that the down curve must presently turn upward, nor can he accept the past average, which is much higher than the current figure, as a normal index of future earnings. But he will be equally cherry about any hasty conclusions to the effect that the company's outlook is hopeless, that its earnings are certain to disappear entirely, 
and that the stock is therefore without merit or value. Lesson 5. The Balance Sheet As is the case today, analysts in Graham's day tended to overlook the valuable information that could be gained by looking at the balance sheet. Graham valued the balance sheet as an analytical tool because assets and liabilities are much harder to manipulate than earnings. This remains just as true today. He saw the balance sheet as useful in two distinct ways. One, where the balance sheet justifies a higher price than is prevailing in the market. Here Graham would look for securities that sold below net current assets, which he used as a proxy for liquidation value. In the 1930s, there were plenty of securities meeting this criteria. Sadly, in today's markets, it's very rare to find any such cases. 2. To detect the presence of financial weakness Graham focused on three factors to monitor weakness in the balance sheet. 1. Cash. Is the cash level adequate? 2. The working capital ratio, equal to current assets divided by current liabilities. Here, Graham accepts the prevailing standard of the day that the working capital ratio should be greater than 2. He also advocates looking at the acid test, otherwise known as the quick ratio. This ratio is the current assets less inventories divided by current liabilities, which Graham suggested should be greater than 1. 3. Debt falling due in the near term. Financial difficulties are almost always heralded by the presence of bank loans or other debt due in a short time. Whenever the statement shows notes or bills payable, the analyst will subject the financial picture to a somewhat closer scrutiny than in cases where there is a clean balance sheet. Lesson 6. Quantitative versus Qualitative Analysis Graham's view was that the markets focus excessively on qualitative factors with little regard to quantitative factors. It is therefore not a surprise that his books focus predominantly on the quantitative factors. Although the stock market has very definite and apparently logical ideas as to the quality of the common stocks that it buys for investments, its quantitative standards governing the relation of price to determinable value are so indefinite as to be almost non-existent. Graham recommended the application of a number of quantitative tests, all of which have been covered earlier in this lecture. 1. The earnings have been reasonably stable. 2. The average earnings bear a satisfactory ratio to market price. 3. The financial setup is sufficiently conservative, and the working capital position is strong. However, he adds to this that the analyst must balance those quantitative factors with qualitative analysis. Quantitative data are useful only to the extent they are supported by a qualitative survey of the enterprise. Graham understood that thorough security analysis would often lead to a different conclusion to the market. Crucial to success in value investing is understanding that the market doesn't always get it right, and that market values may deviate significantly from the intrinsic value. That is what the value investor is always looking to take advantage of. It is customary to refer with great respect to the bloodless verdict of the marketplace, as if it represented invariably the composite judgment of countless shrewd, informed, and calculating minds. Very frequently, however, these appraisals are based on mob psychology, on faulty reasoning, and on the most superficial examination of inadequate information. We hope this lecture has given you a taste for value investing. If you want to read about Graham's philosophy in more detail, we can recommend two excellent books for you. One, Security Analysis by Benjamin Graham and Graham Dodd. This book was first published in 1934 and sets out Graham's investment philosophy in great detail. Two, The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. This book was targeted more toward the layman. It was first published in 1949 and is based on principles covered in security analysis. Once you've honed your value investing skills, show us what you've learned on the StockViews platform. We have many like-minded investors seeking out the kind of stocks Graham would invest in today. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions, please post them here, and we'll be happy to get back to you. StockViews.com, the community for serious investors.